All right. Let's get this thing started. Because uh, Mike has a lot to say. <laughs> yeah. So this is uh, the panel discussion for the, the film fest. The Chamber of Commerce does a film fest every year, and this year's discussion is on 360 storytelling. While there's a lot of gear involved, we're really going to kind of try to focus on what's the story aspect of it, because there's a couple of different challenges between the story and the gear, and how do you merge those two together. So before we get like really to this, who here has seen a 360 movie in some fashion? Who here is shot with 360? Okay. Uh, so one of the problems with 360 storytelling is, in traditional film, the director shows up, or whoever it is, and you've got your two shot, your single, your single, your wide shot. Yeah, there's a system, right? If you watch TV, you know there's a system, and they control it. The writer writes, you know, extreme close up, close up, reverse, and so these are all the conventions that are used in regular filmmaking, where they control what you see. With 360, you don't get that option, right? Does everybody understand how that works? So you see everything around you, and you have the choice of what you see. So now, if you're the writer, if you're the director, how do you control the scene, the mood of the scene, the tone of the scene, without having full control over the expression on the face up close, the two shot, the reaction shot? How do you go about doing it? And are people going to do it? That's part of the question. That, as this whole thing starts out and is fresh and new, how many people are really going to do this? And how many people are going to find it interesting? And how many people are going to? And what are they, what's on their heads? How are they seeing it? Regular glasses, headset glasses. I mean, this company, they do all kinds of stuff with this stuff, and they've got everything. But there's all these pieces that are still being worked out. At the bottom core of everything that happens, it's always about a story, right? If, if the story's not good, nothing else is going to make it better. And, story, and that involves a lot of things. So when you go to the theater, anybody here been to a theater? You know, not, not a movie theater, but a regular theater? You see 180, right? You see the proscenium up here, you watch the actors on stage. You're aware there's an audience behind you, but you don't really look at them. But that's part of the experience. So is that a 360 experience? Or is that really just like a full frontal experience? When you go to the movie theater, same thing. You're watching the big screen, but the people around you, anybody ever sat in an empty movie theater? versus a crowded movie theater, the show. It's a different movie sometimes, right? People will laugh, people will clap, people will, will cry. If, you're, if it's just you by yourself, you may or may not have those same emotions based on what's around you. So while that's not truly 360, that is a form of storytelling because the movie is now evoking emotions on different people and you're feeling that. So while we get into all this stuff, the user experience is key and the user interface is key. So how is that going to work in the future? How is that going to play out? What is going to be the driving force of that? How do I zoom in, if you will? How do I rotate around? Do I have to put something on my head and physically turn around? Do I have a joystick? Can I do it on my watch? You know, I mean, Tom's we're recording this in 360, and Tom's controlling it with his watch. Because you can't come in and push the button and run out, because you'll see you run out. Right? So these are the, just the, the little minor things you have to think about of what you're doing. So the user experience is going to be big in how this is working out. And one of the things that Brick Semple does a lot of is figuring out the user experience for what things are. You can record anything, right? Anybody can pick up a camera and record anything. But if it's not worth seeing, if it's not interesting, then the masses aren't going to see it, or the intended audience isn't always going to see it. So with that, uh, I'm going to let Jesse come up and talk, or sit there and talk, actually, a little bit about Brick Simple and what he does. Jesse is the, God, what are you, the creative director here, yeah. but has a Hollywood history, uh, like, like I came from Hollywood also 20 years, and you were there about the same amount of time. Yeah. Uh, we crossed over a few years, didn't know each other out there, met each other here. But we also work in different parts of the business. But Rick Simple is doing amazing work that have been for the past five or six years, and have been this company for about a dozen years. And uh, they do a lot of amazing stuff that you will never hear about because they're on the forefront of a lot of things right now. So, Jesse, you want to 
Sure, sure. Fill in. Uh, my name is Jesse Berdeka. Uh, I work here at Brick Simple. Uh, I'm going to talk about three things today. First is kind of give you an overview of what Brick Simple does. The second is to kind of show you our VR and AR work that we've been doing. And the third is to talk a little bit about uh, VR storytelling. Um, so if you guys aren't aware, uh, DualSound has a full freight software development uh, firm right here in the middle of DualSound. You're sitting in it. This is the one floor. We actually have a whole floor upstairs. Um, we've been building software here for 15 years um, for inter enterprise, industry, some entertainment stuff. 65 engineers covering every possible skill set here. Uh, and we work in almost every aspect of development, including high level web, mobile, Internet of Things. Does anybody, does anybody know what Internet of Things is? If you haven't heard of it, it's basically how machines talk to one another. And it, it along with AR, VR, AI, robotics, are the next generation of uh, computing. That's a really big. Uh, VR and AR, virtual and augmented reality, and wearables. Wearables are things like Fitbits or Apple Watches or what we use them a lot for is things in the healthcare industry. Uh, things like uh, stethoscopes that talk to your medical records or uh, wristbands that uh, uh, watch people with behavioral health issues. All of those are things that we do here uh, in-house. And we have experience in VR and AR. We've got a five-year history with virtual and augmented reality. Um, we experienced development to a full spectrum of hardware. There is a lot of different hardware out there. There's everything from Google Cardboard all the way up to the HTC Vive, and there are dozens of new headsets coming out, both on the AR and VR front, that are going to be better, faster, need less computing power. Um, all of them are just, there's just some amazing stuff coming out. And all of them are equally viable. I know everybody's seen those little cardboard things, and people sometimes poo poo them, they're just like, oh, that's like a throwaway. Cardboard is absolutely fantastic. It's one of the most democratic ways to witness uh, VR. It's a great way to get involved in VR and see how things are done. Um, if you are doing something like you're doing work right now with the University of Pennsylvania on teaching people CPR, this device is very easy for a couple of dollars to send to inner cities and actually be able to take, have someone take their phone and put it in there and they can actually learn CPR in virtual reality. You can't send a vibe to every house you know, in the city, but this you can actually do as a mail. Mail it flat, goes out, they put their phone in, they can learn a skill like CPR or Heimlich maneuver. These are things that weren't possible in the past or were only possible using video or, or things like that. And we specialize mostly in enterprise, which is business, healthcare, and industrial. Uh, my background is storytelling. I was a development, and, uh, a development exec in the film industry for years. Uh, and so one of the things that's missing from a lot of VR and AR experiences today is storytelling. How do you guide the user through an experience that is intuitive and allows them to understand what the story is you're trying to tell? Uh, and we have specific uses in data visualization, training, and compliance. There is a lot of stuff being done in VR and AR right now that I'm sure people have seen it that's very gimmicky. It's like, it's like uh, back in the 1950s when 3D movies came out, there was a movie uh, called Moana Devil, and it was famous because it had like the spear coming at it. It was a gimmick. It had nothing to do with the story. It was just a cool way to show you 3D. VR and AR, there's a lot of that in there too. But there's some great ways that VR and AR can be used in the industry right now. And data visualization is one. Being able to show people in 3D data that they couldn't have otherwise seen it also works really well any time where you have an experience that may be too difficult, too expensive, or too dangerous. Uh, extinguisher training is extremely dangerous and extremely expensive. You actually have to go out and get a burn permit, permit from the borough, get the set of pan of gasoline on fire, you know, it's, it, there's variables. You can do a lot of stuff in VR and AR, it has kind of the same kind of experience much safer, much less expensive, uh, and be able to collect data on those experiences as well. Uh, this is our virtuality works with industry, industrial training of intricate electronic assemblies. I have a little video here that I'll show you. Um, this was something that we did for uh, TET. Does anybody remember the old company Tyco? They're like a big manufacturing company, uh, industrial company. Well, they suddenly became TE, and this was an experience that we did for them where we train people on how to assemble uh, different, different things.
This is one of our software engineers here. You'll actually be able to see he's pulling parts and actually assembling them. And if he gets it wrong, the whole thing drops to the ground and he has to start all over again. So it, 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 has, uh, it has great work uh, uses for things like that. Uh, this was something that was uh, uh, really useful, hand-washing compliance. The average hospital loses $1.3 million a year to non-hand-washing compliance, diseases like non-MRSA related. That's huge. A 1% increase in hand-washing efficiency saves the average hospital $40,000. Now you say, hey, it's easy to take somebody over to a sink and train them how to wash their hands. It is, but you cannot see germs. With this experience that we built, the, the headset actually visualizes, see where your hands are touching, and it maps out and shows you where you're missing. Not only that, it collects that data and, and puts it in a big table so that if everyone going through the experience is missing the inside of their pinky finger, well, guess what? We have to adjust our training because that's an important thing we're missing. They can also track individual people and say, hey, who needs to be uh, better trained on this? And we could, this can be adapted. Right now it's adapted for the World Health Organization non-surgical protocol, but it can be adapted for anything from surgeons all the way down to ServeSafe, which guides the hand washing technique for almost every restaurant in America. So I'll show you this real quick. And forget the music is always the same in these, so I'll put that in advance. I've gone mad listening to it after a while. So you can actually choose if you have a male or female hands. You can adjust uh, your skin color so that it matches your hands. And there is a sensor on the front of the headset that, is that those are actual hands, your hands. It's picking that up and doing it. And then this is a model of a real surgical sink. And that's an evaluation if you hold your hands up those black areas will show you where there are germs still uh, on your hands. And that's only going to get more elaborate as we put more design into it. You can actually put soap on your hands. And then the training uh, part of this, it will actually guide you through step by step the actual protocol for non-surgical hand washing. And as they wash the hands, they can go put it back up against evaluation and see the spots they missed and get graded on it. So the, the other thing that we are doing a lot of is AR training. The difference between VR and AR, VR is an entirely created world that is in the headset. AR is uh, computer, computer generated images that are overlaid over real life. So it's like my glasses and I'm seeing all of you, but I'm also seeing computer generated uh, things in real life. And this is something else that we did uh, for TE. This was for, you can actually do maintenance on a machine and have no you don't have to have any knowledge on how a machine works. It will actually walk you around and point out exactly where everything happens in a machine, what the parameters are, what you actually have to do. This is the Microsoft HoloLens. It's probably the best AR headset on the market, although there are new ones coming out almost every day. And they're actually seeing this in real life. They can, they can do troubleshooting on machinery. And then they actually have uh, a guide on the floor. They can walk around the machine, following the guide. It takes them exactly where they have to go. And then there's an arrow that points them right to the part that they have to fix on the machine. And then this is probably the thing that I'm most proud of. Um, CPR training. CPR training is notoriously difficult because Everybody presses on the dummy, but no one really seems to know what happens inside the human body. So we built this as an AR simulator when you're wearing the Microsoft HoloLens. As you're pressing on the dummy, excuse me, mannequin, they don't like the term dummy. When you're pressing on the mannequin, uh, you can actually see what it's doing inside the body, how it's compressing the heart, how it's sending blood out. Uh, and this was something that we did for, in conjunction with the University of Pennsylvania. that music skipped to you already. <laughs> Sorry, it sounds a little bad. Right? And it looks like it's flat up there, but when you're witnessing it, it looks like it's inside the body. 
gives you a score on every parameter of what you're doing. Feedback collects the data so you can do better next time. We recently won the Half It Up at University of Pennsylvania with this app. And so, this gets us to the next thing we're talking talk, talk about is uh, VR storytelling. <clears throat> Virtual and augmented realities are brand new forms of storytelling. Everyone says this. This is like, this is a brand new way of storytelling. All the rules are out the window. This is brand new. We all have to figure out how to use this. The answer to that is no, they are not. Storytelling never changes. It has not changed in a thousand years. It has not changed in 5,000 years. It is why the Odyssey is still a great book. Storytelling, the fundamentals of storytelling do not change. They are hardwired into our DNA. Stories that resonate with us, that are popular, that stand the test of time, it doesn't matter if it's in a song, if it's in a book, if it's in a television show, a movie, or if it's on a wall of a cave in France. It is all the same. The tool is different, but storytelling is always the same. The rules always apply, and so, um, when you hear people talking about this is a new form of storytelling, it is not. It is a new tool for storytelling, and you have to learn how to use that tool. But for anyone who is getting into this business and wants to tell stories in the 360, learn the fundamentals of real storytelling first. The rest of it you can figure out later. But if you don't have the fundamentals of how protagonists work, you know, theme, subtext, all these things that make up a good story, all your 360 training in the world is not going to make up for that. So VR storytelling is just a new tool. Uh, we've been doing some VR storytelling here. We've been doing, uh, we're trying to work on a documentary for the ALS uh, Society about patients with ALS and what their story is. And the fundamental stories I'm telling are the same as they've been for thousands of years. VR is just a tool. We do use of ways of using this tool and new, the old ways do not work. What um, Rick was saying about at the beginning where like you had a narrow window on a story and now you have 360 degrees, how do you use it? If it's just where you're still just telling the story with two people in front of you, and you just happen to be filming the rest of it, you're basically wasting everybody's time. Because if you're using all that space just to say, oh, I can look behind me, it, it, it doesn't make sense. The other thing that doesn't make sense is you'll hear a lot of people say, well, it could be a choose your own adventure. You can go in there and you can go wherever you want. You can make up the story. That's not, how, that's not a story, that's not how a story works. Story is not a choose your own adventure. Story is a person's point of view telling you something uh, in a format that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. If you just go in there and explore a world, it's just a world exploration. That's not a story. Even video games where you can kind of walk around and do what you want, they still bring you back to what the core of the story is. And so that brings me to my next is how do you handle some of these storytelling things in 360? I like to think of a virtual does anybody know what a chord is? A chord is, if, if anybody who has, doesn't know music, you can play a note like a C note, and it's just a simple string, you play it, bing, you get a C note. Or you can play what's called a chord. And a chord is the C note, but it's two other notes, or three, or whatever it is, that go with it, and when those all work together, they round out that C so that it's much fuller and bigger sound. So I like to think of VR storytelling as a chord. Meaning, you, in the old days, when you were watching a movie, you had that C note in front of you, but now with VR, you have all these other notes that you can add to it to make it into a chord. And each note complements the other. So that brings it off the possibility for many stories that can work together at the very same time. You're still having a point of view, but at the same time, you're telling other stories that complement what your main story is. For example, say you had a diner and you had a teenage boy and a girl sitting at a booth, and the girl is breaking up with a boy, and you're going through this scene. In a normal movie, you would shoot that scene, and that would be it. But in VR, behind you, you could have a scene where you have a, an older waitress who is, her husband is bringing her lunch. And then outside the window, you know, off to the side, maybe you have, uh, you know, a guy getting out of a car and holding the door open for the girl. All three of those are different stages of a romance. All of those are complementing your main story. And you can turn around 
and pay attention to the waitress and her husband and watch that story, now the story of the kid and, and his girlfriend at the table is complementing that story. All of those are working together. You're using subtext in different areas all at the same time to kind of tell a story. And that's where VR storytelling is going. It's not going to be uh, a choose your own adventure. It's not going to be one focus with a bunch of cool stuff behind it. It's going to be little stories like this that surround it, that add subtext, character, and complement whatever the main story is. But it's still going to have a point of view. Yeah, it's much more difficult to do. It basically means you're writing three or four stories for a film rather than just one. But the layers that it adds into and the complexity it'll add to the story is something that when people start to figure out exactly what it is, the first person who really does it well, it's going to be a really rewarding experience. So that is my presentation for today. Thank you guys very much. All right, so you're beginning to see a little bit about the story. Story, story, story. We sat around campfires and told stories. We watch TV to tell stories. We talk to each other and tell stories. Without story, communication really breaks down. It's, it's not as interesting and it's not, you're not committed to the other person's point of view. Now we have the technology, finding the right, I don't know, for, formats not even the right term to use, but the right method of creating this additional space with more story is really what makes it complicated. And no matter what gear you have, while this camera setup works and is great, only a couple years old, it's been on the market, you know, two years from now, this will be obsolete and something else will be here. Before you guys got here, we're talking about a company that just went out of business and they had a $60,000 360 camera. And this is 1,000? It's not yeah. now, like 700. Yeah. 700 bucks, you can buy this, and it does a lot. Does it do as much as 60,000? It may, maybe, maybe not, but in the grand scheme of things, it does everything and more for a lot less money. So it's gonna keep getting smaller, faster, easier, cheaper, and you're gonna all figure it out. So the gear is the least important part. The story is what really matters in everything. Would you agree with that, Jim? Absolutely. Jim is a writer, a critiques movie scripts for a living. So uh, story is very important to him. So next up, uh, Thomas Brunt. Tom is local. Tom is a, he, his day job is a engineer on big sports trucks, but he's really a professional doodler. He has 3D printers, he does drones, he's got 360 cameras. Tom is like the guy that everybody in town goes to for what's the newest gadget, because he has it at his house, I can tell you that. Uh, so Tom, do you want to come talk about what? Yes. Your latest thing, what you got going on? Absolutely. And he just actually used it. Uh, what he's going to show you mm -hmm. Friday night in, in the real world, and it's got like great reviews, not just from him, but from other people who were there. So, so thanks, Rick. Um, yeah, as I pretty much as Rick said, I'm kind of like a doodler in the new technology. I like exploring what you can do with it, and kind of learning as everyone else is. Uh, we're kind of all pioneers right now in how you use this and, and what you can do with it. Um, so, and being the engineer type, uh, it's kind of my job to solve a problem. So, one of the things that kind of fascinated me about 360 and was also with the challenge of 360, as Rick pointed out, that there's no, there is no like fourth wall, there's no behind the scenes. Everything here is being seen, including the bottom of that tripod, the ceiling, everything. So that makes for a lot of challenges. One, uh, you can't have a camera operator because you're in the scene. What do you do for the normal equipment that you use in uh, higher level productions, uh, even like lighting, sound, anything? Um, what kind of gave me the idea was uh, I had just recently gotten one of the, the new cameras that came out, the Theta. It's a little, it's a very small one. It's a consumer one. And I like going to uh, local music venues. And I was at one of my favorite hangouts, Mom's up the street here. And they had this uh, band, uh, a bluegrass band, in the round. Now they all sat around, it was like a stool in the middle, and they all sat around in circles and chairs, just jamming. And I had my little camera with me, and I thought, that might be kind of, I mean, that might be kind of cool. So I'll put the, put the camera down. And here's what I have here. 
Now, as you see, it's it's very uh, not very bright. Uh, let me go to the video here. The video is even worse. Uh, there is like no. Um, Now, this would look great, except, wow, it's so bad. So, and actually, so I got, I started thinking, how can I, what can I do? How can I uh, improve upon that? That's, that's going to be a problem that a lot of people starting to get in with 360 are going to start to realize. So, in a lot of different applications, I thought, uh, I was trying to think, well, what would I do with, how would you light something? If I put a light somewhere, you're going to see it. And... What am I lighting? Do I light just one person? Do I light a couple people? What do you do? So what I ended up doing um, is I started coming up with an idea uh, for a, a 360 uh, lighting uh, product. Um, and I've actually gone through the process of, uh, I have a patent uh, underway uh, with it. Um, and I asked my, uh, my attorney, I said, well, you know, while the patent's underway, can I like start to like, show this to people and talk to people. She said, yes, no problem. Just make sure that they see it is patent pending. <laughs> so there's a, there's a couple of patent drawings uh, on it. And what I decided to do was, um, let me show this. this. is actually one of the pictures that I shot uh, the other night. Um, this was at the Mercer Museum, had an event called Cocktails at the Castle. One of the things I decided to do was um, try to do event photography in 360. It's a neat perspective. You can do, this is a, not a regular 360 you can spin, this is just a cropped image, but you can do a lot of interesting perspectives with this. Um, so anyway, back to what I um, wanted to come up with, I decided that, well, I could hide the light in the place, the one place that's considered kind of like the junk view of 360. Wherever it's mounted to, whatever it's mounted to, whether you're holding it in your hand, whether it's on a tripod, what have you. So I did a lot of coming up with design. Uh, I bought a 3D printer, taught myself how to use CAD, taught myself how to use the printer. And, uh, and before I did that, this was like my first prototype. You remember this, oh, yeah. Rick? There you are. Oh, there's Rick. Hi. Yeah, there's Rick. <laughs> uh, so I, I came, this was a uh, What I have is, um, this is the big version of the video light. Uh, you have to excuse my messy garage. But I started with a video light first. And the idea is, is that the, uh, the light's in here. And what the camera sees when it looks down is just a dark circle. The light being is um, uh, kept in such a way that the camera doesn't see reflections of the light. Um, and it is shaped in a way so that it can still direct light around, even though it can't go up, basically. Into the uh, into the lens, so that's my first light I came up with, and I, I then decided I thought uh, still photography might be an interesting um, uh, an interesting application for this. I'm thinking of uh, event photography. Uh, I, I had the privilege of doing the uh, cocktails at the castle, um, and well, to do it in 360. I mean, normally it's very dark areas. Normally with photography, you use a, you would use a flash. You'd be insane to be shooting without the flash. That makes 360 kind of kind of difficult. So what I ended up doing is I came up with uh, a flash attachment. So this is my prototype, and uh, it ties to this is the Theta camera, which is a popular consumer camera, and so I took this to the cocktails at the castle. And I can either hold it in my hand or put it on a tripod. And the view from the camera is that the, the camera only sees just this dark circle. So what I do is hit the light, say cheese. There you go. So uh, <laughs> that's what uh, that's what it does. It triggers, uh, it's basically like to prove the concept of a flash uh, being controlled by uh, controlling the camera itself. And what it gets you is, I don't know, quite a little video that I made. So I did kind of like a before and an after. Ambient light 
and then with the photo flash. Basically, same scene. So uh, you'll see a couple of examples here of the difference of how it fills in and gives you some definition and color in what otherwise is, is just, well, ambient light. Uh, this would be kind of tough to do. Here's a scene, I, I did a group shot around a table, putting a camera in the middle and everybody smiled and they took a picture. And you see, trying to do that with no light at all, uh, we, we really wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't make it very viable to, uh, to use. And this is at uh, that local bar again. Flash, no flash, and then the flash on the uh, on the right. And then um, what you see is, in this case, I'm holding it, but just a dark circle, where normally uh, a lot of uh, 360 videos. What gave me the inspiration for is a lot of 360 content I see, uh, documentaries or like commercials I've seen on Facebook. They will actually put a circle and put maybe like the logo or put ABC News in that. So I'm basically kind of making the circle for them to use in a way. Um, because the light has to, something is going to be seen. But I figured a, a dark circle is at least obnoxious. And it, it would make the light a lot more usable. Um, High-end production would probably need uh, maybe different uh, applications, but I consider this um, in, in broadcasting, it's called an ENG light. It uh, became used, it's the little light that goes on the camera that you do for quick interviews and the like. I consider this the ENG light of 360. It's quick, it go in, you can shoot a scene, and you see everything. I'm hoping to, um, uh, once the patent goes uh, through, I'm hoping to um, interest the lighting manufacturers. Uh, hopefully first, and then of course the camera manufacturers, uh, hoping for a lighting company that would be interested in producing this, because it's scalable to size. It has to be a certain size, it has to be big enough to be a little larger than the lens footprint of the camera, otherwise it will not work. Uh, but that's, that's, that's what I have. Could I be all? So that night that we were at Mom's, we were sitting there looking at the, at the building itself, and I'm going, well, Tom, we put LED lights behind the columns, like where these columns are, to light the back wall. And if you had strips of LED lights here, and while it solved a lot of, you could hide lights to solve a lot of the lighting problems around the room, the reality is right here is what you really want to be seeing, and so you don't have a way to solve that. So when, when we had this little prototype, uh, Tom's the prototype, and it was like, this really, this works well. You know, refinement, of course, but that's how you develop products. So it's a need, and it's a need that's needed. And I'm sure Sean talked about some of this when he talked about his film and the process of, I don't know if you guys have ever been on a film set, but you know, you get lights, and it's not like one or two. I mean, you're talking like a lot of, a lot of power, because without lighting and sound, the film is really pretty useless. Cameras don't matter if you don't have light and sound. Well, it sounds different than the camera, but you know what I mean. Uh, so, Next up is Mr. Mike Manning. Mike, Mike is local. Mike is Mr. Mr. Storyteller, Mr. PR. He does lots of really interesting projects. Uh, the thing about Mike is, I've known Mike for a long time also. This can go anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably not going to go the way you want it. Uh, but everything Mike does from the PR, when, when he's working in PR or when he's working with a camera, he's always thinking about What's the story within the frame? The frame changes, just like the technology changes, but within that frame, there's always the story piece of it. So we've had many conversations about how he is differentiates himself from a lot of PR people who just put out press releases about, buy my new thing. He actually goes far deeper into the next level of what's the storytelling piece of it. And consequently, he works with a lot of um, tech startups, some of which you know the names of, and does really amazing work, and he just gets the idea of storytelling. So that's probably better than you thought it was going to be, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exact opposite of what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> uh, so I've been doing this for about 25 years now, uh, doing PR and storytelling. Uh, some of it's been traditional PR. I'm going to buy us some time on back too because I don't have any slides. I just want to talk to you. Uh, the concept, uh, you know, what Jesse has set out, you know, storytelling hasn't changed. 
you know, from a business standpoint, it really hasn't. A lot of people don't understand that, though. They just want to spout out some facts, and they forget that stories have to have some emotion to them. Right? They have to have a hero. They have to have a villain. Right? They've got to have a little bit of an arc to them. And people forget about that. Right? They just want to look at my stuff. Talk to them. Come by my stuff. Look what it does. And they don't, and they don't make it human. I was actually down in Philly earlier today helping some social startups, uh, social, not social media, but social community uh, startups to figure out what their stories were at, at a hackathon. And they all, a lot of them started with these fake scenarios. And I was like, you know, one of them was talking about how do they collect data you know, during times of disaster. And the, the um, startup person was talking about, so tell me your story. Well, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a imagine this fictional person uh, a doctor that had to get data down in, down in uh, Puerto Rico last week or two weeks ago. And I said, okay, well, stop. Tell me about you. What, what were you thinking about the first time that you, you know, when you came up with this idea for this for this for this product? Because while I was down in Puerto Rico, I said, uh, here's your story. <laughs> I said, don't make up somebody. You were right there. That just that drags me right on in. So I want to tie it a little bit back to the virtual reality side of this and the 360. Jesse and I sort of come from uh, from the, sort of a similar approach of stories haven't changed, right? You still get around the campfire, you still you still tell a story. What I do believe VR opens us up to are sort of the days of that two, that traditional two hour movie, right, where you're, where you're captivated for two hours, starts to expand and ongoing stories, right? And it's not just, you know, narratives that are confined to a single blockbuster story arc, but infinite mini arcs as you go through there. It's not going down a rabbit, it's not necessarily going down a rabbit hole of choose your own adventure, but like you were saying with the, with the diner, you can now, now all of a sudden, every character that's in that scene, you can build a story for them. So as a so as a storyteller as a, as a movie maker, what does that what does that do to how you're telling that story? Right, because you have the ability to keep going and driving down deeper and telling a then telling a fuller story. Right, everybody everybody's gonna have backstories here. Right, the, all those character backstories that end up on the on the uh, cutting room floor or just stuck in a notebook someplace. Now what happens? They become their own. They can they become their own potential. Mini arcs and part of the story. How do you tie? How do you tie them together? Right? Everybody's everybody gets to play a play a leading role. So it, you know, it's no longer enough just to write the opening line and wrap the hero in a cape in the final scene, because there, ne- there doesn't necessarily have to be a ultimate final scene. You and I will probably argue about that, and that's why the panels are so much fun. That's, <laughs> that's why I didn't bring slides, but I want to get to that. Because there isn't necessarily a final scene anymore. You can keep going, you can keep diving down. There might be multiple final scenes, depending on who the, who the characters are and, who, and where the narratives are. Right? And then how does that, inter- how does that affect the audience? Right? So you, as, you're, as you're writing, as you're telling that story, these become immersive stories, not just sitting at a theater Right? And I've done the sitting single person at a theater uh, before. Um, not the kind of theater that you're thinking of. But um, yeah, so I've been in, I've been in those. And it's, it, is, it is different when you are there with a group of people. What happens when you're there with a group of people and now there are, you know, there's characters and environments all the way around you. How does that change the emotion of the, of the movie, right? Or of the story? And then, I, and then I get back to sort of the area that I know I know most is the non-entertainment side of this. Right? So it's not just film for entertainment, but it could be film for business. How does a company, how does a company use VR and, and uh, to expand how they do, how they tell their stories? Could Microsoft, a company that I'm sure all of us in this room have mocked endlessly for ye- for years, uh, and who I would now start to put bets on? Uh, despite the fact that I'll probably never get hired by them for some of the things that I've said in the past, um, right? How how is it? How could how could they tell different stories using VR? 
Think about it with from from a from customer support or customer service. Right? Now all of a sudden, or even their de- even their developer experience, their software developers. Microsoft has an amazing software development team. They keep hiring some of the best and brightest in the business. If you're not watching it, watch it. It's amazing what's what's going on there. But how do they now? Could they could they bring use VR to create narratives that bring potential recruits or students inside that develop their developer team, right? Inside that development that development um, mindset. How could they how could they use that to bring them in? It's not just technology, right? It's the story that they're telling. They have an on businesses have ongoing stories. So how do you use the technology to bring that in? You know, customer customer support. I don't, even, I don't even know where to begin with customer with customer support when you're doing something like this. Right now, we do, you know, for product breaks, what do you do? You go to Google and you read an FAQ that is strictly text based, and maybe it has a couple of diagrams. Maybe we start to do calls. Maybe it's call centers, right? Which is just voice. Great, that's always fun. Right? Some of the stuff that Jesse and Brick Simple are doing starts to move us closer. So you start to see the actual products. But you know, what if what if you didn't do it so that it was just reactionary? What if as you bought the product, as I bought the phone, there was an immersive experience, right? There was a virtual experience and a narrative that allowed me to be part of the action of the actual product. Right? So it didn't just become a device, it became an actual environment and an experience and an experience. So, a couple of, two, I'll leave you with a couple of things, uh, at least off of this talk. Go out and read uh, the Boston Globe, their film critic, Ty Burke, uh, recently had a piece in, uh, in MIT's technology review called Hollywood Has No Idea What to Do with VR. Read it. Really good stuff on, sto- on storytelling in there. Um, really, really good. And then I read an article recently from uh, Google's head of, of VR, Jessica Brillhart. She had a great she had a great quote. With VR, it's about you being convinced that you're physically in another space. And so with VR, it's about you being convinced that you're physically in another space. I think that's a really important statement, right? Especially with storytelling, because storytelling by its nature is about taking Think about Stephen King or any anybody that even writes a book, or if you read a book, why do you read it? Cal God, take me away, right? Take me to take me someplace else. Make me make me go away and get into put me into that story. That's how you. That's how we're moving forward. We need to start thinking about this because it's not just enough to put me in the theater and let me watch and let me watch this story. It's take me away, put me into put me into the story. And, and tell the story that way. So that's all I have. I told you I'd give you some time back. <laughs> and I like to get to the panel. Because the panel is straight All right. Well, so a couple of things Mike said that are really important. Does, it, does everybody understand what story art means when he talked about story? Yes? No? Mm-hmm. So story art, every story, there's everything's great, problem, how do we solve the problem? Oh my God, this is going great. Another problem, problem over here. You're doing this, right? You get the highs and lows. That's a very simplification of it. But that's how story art works. So if everything's all great, it doesn't matter. 30 second TV commercial. Mom, I'm hungry. Oh no, gotta feed the kids. Ah, McDonald's, F- problem solved. Great, right? Problem solved, story. 30 seconds, that's what works. You're talking about take me away. I did the, all the first couple of years of the um, want to get away, the Southwest Airlines, the refs. The, all those things. We did those with the agency and we were talking about the only there was a way we could like have people like push a button and go wherever they wanted to. So as soon as you said that, I hadn't thought about that in years, but that was one of the things we talked about with the agency, like you know, we couldn't do it back then because back in the nineties. But it, that that kind of thought was there. How do we do that? And that campaign is still running. Twenty years later, they're still doing that same campaign. You gotta get away? Southwest Airlines. Uh, but on the story arc thing, if you, if you guys haven't read uh, Joseph Campbell's um, what it, Man, Man with a Thousand Faces, if you haven't read that book, I strongly encourage, if you want to understand story and story arc and the hero's journey and all that kind of stuff, 
great book will really give you a good solid foundation. There's a lot of other good books on writing, but that's just one that is um, just really awesome. Last thing is Mike's talking about how you do different things. Uh, about a year and a half ago, Jen and I were here, and uh, the Oculus had just come out, and there's they have a program where you can have your computer screen, so you have all your stuff, and you're standing here, and you're literally touching thin air, and you turn this way, and there's another screen, and you turn this way, and there's another screen, and I was blown away by this because it was like, oh my god, I don't need a screen now. I can just sit in a chair, and I can you can have infinite screens, infinite information at, right here, right in front of you. And while that's not true storytelling, the people that are creating that, the people that are using that, how they're going to sell that is going to be their story, which is different than a film story, but it always goes back to the story, because in advertising, everything is a story. Marketing, everything is a story, right? So, with that, let's go to the film guy. So Sean is a local guy, uh, lives down the main line, I guess. He's not really Doylestown local, but he's local enough. And he has done a film in 360. Questions you guys have, uh, be able to put the Google goggles on and see a little bit of what he does and see it in 360. Uh, but you have to download an app and it's going to be a little tech to get that working. Uh, so Sean's going to talk first and then we'll see where we go from there from a discussion, visualization kind of thing. But you'll be able to see some of it here. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sean McKnight. I'm from a, a, cinema, uh, or, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a filmmaker. I have a uh, company called Cinema Lands here in the Philly area. I'm also a partner of a company called uh, out of Canada called uh, Magic Door Films as well. And uh, what I'm here to talk about today, uh, you heard some of the more kind of corporate applications, advertising. I'm going to focus more on the creative side as far as uh, storytelling goes with regard to VR and film and uh, as far as narratives go. And uh, you heard some of the challenges that we're facing now that are a little different, the environment being one of those things and that it's a complete <laughs> environmental immersion. So how you direct actors is different too. So obviously lighting and things like that are important. Um, so we're relying more on practical lighting. Uh, obviously we can't set up like normal can lights and stands and things like that. So we have to kind of really kind of focus on what the environment is like that we're working with. This is actually in the ballroom room in New Jersey. I uh, guess those are actors. Uh, but yeah, so that was something we really looked at and sort of did some testing to see how that was going to go. Another part of the challenge is not just lighting, but also uh, like microphones, because you have to worry about how do you record sound and get all really good sound. So we're using a lot of lavaliers to get hide everything, right? So that's part of the challenge story as well. And then um, working with the actors more creatively is also another one of those issues, because the way you direct is also different. Um, with our actors, they, like one of the questions I got was, uh, okay, how do we do coverage? And I'm like, well, kind of all coverage, like constantly. So the way we had to work with, with how I built them up more emotionally was uh, as a matter of kind of like dialing them up, so to speak, because they have to play bigger than they're used to. Like film is subtle, right? Plays are big because you're working on this big stage and people back there have to be able to see what the actors are doing, so they'll be very grandiose. I had to kind of dial them somewhere in the middle because they have to be big enough to uh, capture the emotions for, for the person that's sort of in the room with them through the VR but then not in a way that's too cartoony. So you have to find a balance there in terms of how you're directing the actors. And it's also more long form. You don't, as you heard earlier, there's no close-ups, there's no two shots, with no what's yes, stuff like that. So uh, with that in mind, you're relying less on cuts when it comes to the editing standpoint. So the way the storytelling works, it's in longer bursts rather than short, quick, you know, kind of like that. So you're not doing like nine, you know, a bunch of takes, and it's, it's more like, again, sort of like a play and video form. So that's where some of it gets a little tricky there. Uh, no, I'll figure it out. Uh, <laughs> so with, as far as how you direct actors as well. So how you write also is impacted by that too, because I'm a writer and when we're writing scripts, uh, it gets a little tricky thinking about, well, how are we going to do this scene? And then we have to block it out when we're directing a little bit differently as well. So we're going to write a shoot another film here shortly. And we had to sort of figure out what the chunks were and get the actors prepared for that. So that's also another thing that the actors prep is different as well. They can't do this like, uh, just like page to page thing, they have to be able to do four pages in one shot, or six pages, or whatever it is, non stop, you know, like one long take. So that's also a new challenge for the actors as well. So it all affects the storytelling process how you write, um, how the actors are going to sort of play through that, how much improv you let them, you know, kind of get through in the case of that, uh, to the point where I've actually started studying improv. Because I want to know more about it, because it's more of a, so much more of a live thing when you're directing it. So yeah, I want to understand more about the tool book. So that's all part of it. 
And then uh, another thing you've heard also is like, well, how do we derive, uh, how do we get your attention on things? Well, that ha it happens on a couple different levels when it comes to storytelling in VR. Uh, one thing, just moving the actors, and then the, you'll track with your head where they go, and you can kind of lead people around the room that way. Uh, we'll use sound, because it's fully immersive uh, sound, it's 360 sound, so you'll hear things coming back there. So then you're supposed to look over here, so we use sound. Uh, I've also seen some clever use of like focus and darkness and lightness. So if you ever get a chance, if you really want to see good examples of all this, uh, there are VR apps out there. They're like networks, basically, for VR. Uh, there's one called Jaunt, there's another one called Within, uh, another one called Little Star, and there's another one called Lens that you can look for. They're all free, you can download them for PlayStation VR, Oculus, uh, Biophasm, uh, all the other systems, I'm sure, have access to them. Um, of course, uh, uh, YouTube has a VR you know, whole thing now, that's where my video is currently. Uh, for the current film I'm working on for finishing now. But uh, yeah, if you watch the films on there, you can see how they're using these vehicles to kind of get you to look at things, so it's important to pay attention to that, because you'll have the first kind of wow moment when you get into the environment, because it, as it is, uh, it, it's one thing that's different if you've never seen it. We're used to this flat screen where we're just kind of participant and you have all this other distraction around you, but when you're in the VR, you're standing in the room. So we'll put you right next to the actors, so that's why, you know, when you're in a creepy room like a morgue, you'd be like, ah, his body's here, but I'm standing next to them now, and I'm just watching them on this flat surface now. So we can use vehicles like that to kind of draw your attention and crank the creep factor, you know, those kinds of elements if we want to drive things up more emotionally. So part of it is in the planning, uh, and also a big part of it's in the editing. So because the way you can spin the footage, and I'm going to show you that here in a minute, where you can rotate it, move it around, I can place it at different points where I'll start you here, but then you'll have to lead around from there because your head is the camera. So you're, you always, you can, you put, there's a, when you cut to one shot, there's a starting point where someone's looking forward where you can start the process. And you can even see companies, we're all still, this is, a, it's new in the sense of how we're using it and how we can apply it. VR is not new, new, it's been around at least since the 90s. But uh, as far as how we're <laughs> kind of putting all this together, there's still a lot of learning lessons. And you can see that big companies making major mistakes. If you go into Little Star or John, look for the Rogue One uh, promo piece. It's something they did with Nissan and Star Wars. And they made this huge mistake in it. And it's a big learning lesson for everybody because it was something that really hit me hard as far as the importance of editing and understanding where that first shot is and you're going to cut. So uh, if you get a chance to watch it, it's this little thing they did with Star Wars in the Rogue One movie when it came out. So they do this thing where you're on the desert and all of a sudden the, 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 the uh, stormtroopers show up and rebels show up and you're in the middle of this big fight. And of course the Rogue One shows up, the Nissan Rogue One, that's your escape vehicle, right? To get out of the, out of, out of the battle. But the big mistake they make is when they cut, they cut um, inside the car but you're facing the driver's seat instead of out the window. So I'm sitting here going, why am I staring at the seat? And then I realized I had to spin around all the way around to see out the front window. So it was a big editing error on their part. And this is Disney. So you can learn from other people's mistakes if you look, you know, if you know what to look for. Um, and you know, in terms of covering the camera, watching out for mirrors, anything reflective can be a big issue, um, which is another big you know, thing that can screw you up. But you can also use the environment to your advantage. Like we're getting ready to shoot another film here and we're going to blur rich the actors a little bit. So I'm going to use the environment to like scare them and get some genuine reactions. And I told them, I said, just be ready. It's going to be a little bit of a fun house when we shoot. So you can use the environment that way, knowing how to kind of work with it when you have that sort of immersion and you have the actors drop right in the middle of it and you get to kind of mess with their environment in the process. So yeah, that's part of the fun. Sounds awesome. Yeah, so, oh yeah, it's a blast. So, but it's just a different way to, you know, to kind of do this whole thing. And there's a lot of potential for it. And there is. Uh, all kinds of ways to tell stories now that are, it's right, I mean, these guys are right about that there's all the same formulas in place, but there's a lot of innovation in place, too. So, and this is, a, now this is a program we've been using that, you know, part of it you got to look into is, of course, the tools you have to work with. And uh, things like, you know, I'm working with Adobe Premiere here, and I'm using these plugins from a company called Metal, M-E-T-T-L-E. And with Metal, uh, I can do things like, I can spin the footage in different ways like this, So I can kind of spin around like this, and I can go through the different axes and sort of get, you know, sort of figure out where my starting point is. And of course, you still have to do things like you still have the same challenge of having to hide the camera. Are you in the room? Uh, no. Well, the camera's in the room. <laughs> so no, I can't be because I'm in the shot. So I'm actually that door. I'm on the other side of that door. 
that's where I'm at. And uh, that's where my sound crew is, that's where everybody is in the shoot, and they're all kind of hanging out up there. <laughs> and then, because right there is the camera, although I have the hidden plate I built. Um, so you can't really see it, of course, and that's the idea. So that's where the camera is. So yeah, um, and so that you have to find ways to hide the camera that's convincing, and of course when you're cutting around, that can be challenging as well. And I have the same rig as that, what you're seeing right there, the Kodak rig. And uh, another thing you have to worry about with this footage, if you're not distraction, it pulls them away from, oh, I saw this thing, and now I'm not thinking about the story anymore. So you gotta watch out for that too, because there's something that can get an interfere with the process if you're not careful about how you're editing and you're, you're handling the post and uh, really being conscientious about where the cameras are. So, yeah, that was it for me. Do you see this like in the near future? Because I don't think anybody can predict anything more than like a year out, you know, with, with what's going on. But so something like this. So you can start this wherever you want, right? Yeah. yeah. But now, at a certain point, are you taking the camera and moving it in like ten feet, and then uh, given the option to cut a little bit? Scene? I did. You did that a little bit. There's a point here where there's this. There is sort of a jump scare where it's like so there's a corpse in front of you. So I did move the camera more proximal to that. So you have to be aware of the physical space you're in, how to get that close-up thing, because one thing you don't have is the luxury of being able to use tricks like scaling the footage up, that kind of thing doesn't work. So you gotta be really conscientious about where that camera is in terms of where you want that punch if there's like a, like that kind of moment. So yeah, I did have to, there was a point where I did move the camera further in where there's, there's a body that shows up like standing like, like right there. Right. So yeah. Because you guys know, I mean, you start like with a wide shot. So let's say you've got your back, if I want to see all you guys, I might start with like a, at 80, 80 millimeter here. Then I move in closer and I'm on a 50, so it changes a little bit. Then I might come into a single with a 35, then I might do an extreme close up with like a 14 or something, and then back back up to a 50. And so I'm adjusting the camera lenses of what you're seeing all along the way. And with this, you're talking about a fixed lens. So do you move the camera? Do you, how do you, but it has to be a cut. And then it's, and then it's an obvious cut that moves in. So if you're watching, all of a sudden you cut now, you, re, you restart where this entry is into the next scene, if you will, or a continuation of that scene. How much can you disrupt that scene before it's too disruptive and not just an edit? So these are the things that is still being figured out. I mean, it's, there's a lot going on as well. So at this point, I think, do you guys have any questions you want to ask the panelists? Do you want to, anything you really want to know, want to figure out? Um, does it work in storytelling? I would think that 360 changes everything, but I would think that if you're, um, you're basically emulating human perception and um, awareness of everything at 360 degrees. So since you're, since you're emulating human perception, what well, can you do zooms? Does it work to do zooms where you close in, where you got 360 world, you close in on this, and this happens, and zooming in, you're highlighting something, some person talking, and then you're zooming out into a world, regular world, and you're zooming into something else. Wouldn't that work? You're, there, first of all, there's a lot of things that you can't do that you can do in a normal film that, and I'm sure Sean will test this, like zooms and things like this, it's very difficult to do without giving somebody like some kind of vertigo. But the other thing I would say to that is, is that, you know, when you do story, story doesn't necessarily match human perception. The, the, the thing I would like to say is, who, anybody ever had like the banana, banana candies? Banana candies taste nothing like banana. They taste like what we perceive banana, what we think banana tastes like. And story is that same way. If people, if you put the way we talk into a movie, it would sound like a hot mess because movie dialogue is meant to emulate the way we think people should talk. Movies are meant to be the way we think people should look like and react to things. If people really act like that in real life, you'd be like, crap, what's wrong with you? You know what I mean? Why are you talking like that? You know, but it seems natural in a film. So trying to mimic human perception is the wrong kind of question to ask. The question is, how do I get across human motion using this new tool in such a way that people empathize with it, they don't think it's foreign, and they think it's intuitive and natural to watch it that way. At least that's my opinion. Well, um, yes, but no, because you are basically 
you're not just analyzing human deception, but you're, you're basically you're you're guiding you're t- guiding the viewer audience, and you're leading them along, and you're moving them towards this and towards that. So wherever they're comfortable looking, so you just follow, just lead them along. Well, you 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 have a point of view. Every story has a point of view. Uh, and I'm one of those people, you know, maybe Mike and I disagree on this, is that, you know, a story has a finite beginning, middle, and end. It, it's, it's, you know, that there is a way to do that. Um, I think people are just starting to, and Sean can probably attest to this, are just starting to find ways to be able to manipulate virtual reality to do those things that you can't do in a traditional film. So it, it, to say that anybody has the answers right now, I always love that scene, and if anybody's ever seen Singing in the Rain, where they're trying to do the, the first time they're using sound, and they're trying to pin the microphone in the big precise, <laughs> and she's like, I can't, yeah, you go back and forth. That's pretty much where we are in VR. Like, those things have not been figured out yet. And it's great, it's great to see people come up with different solutions to do that, but I, I'd be lying to say if anybody has any really definitive answers on, on how to make it work yet. It, it's kind of like the rule, it's like the, there is really no rule book of, of production yet. We're all, Collectively writing it as we do uh, our projects. And then learning the, as we go. And then the other part, too, is you don't have the saturation. Like in the old days, when you had sound, you had a movie theater. And then millions of people go out and see that movie. And then they would say, yeah, that works. Or no, that doesn't work. Here, you're, you know, you don't have the saturation of everybody watching a VR experience and saying, hey, that technique, that one worked. Or this one doesn't. It's, it's very... Uh, I won't say incestuous, but it's still very small and insular right now. So a lot of things that you're testing out, you won't know if they really work until you get the saturation for people who aren't in the VR world to say, hey, wow, that was really good. I, I didn't even notice that, you know, it was, it, that worked for me. That told that story well. So we don't, we're not at that it's point. It's hit miss because, I mean, I know in the research I've done, most of the articles start with, mm, and then it goes into, <laughs> 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 and that's usually how it starts. And then, it, and then here's what we've discovered so far. And it's like, and we all have these, and, and, and we all have these moments, I think, where we can look at other, that's why I think it's important to study other, others' work, because you can see where they really nailed something, and you can see when they really missed an opportunity, or they, they dropped the ball on something technically, those kinds of things. Like, um, if you know how to work with not covering the plane of where the camera is, there's no excuse for not hiding it. So you can hide it. Like there, I, you know, I did it with a combination of Photoshop, Premiere, and, and a plugin, and it wasn't that difficult to do. So right. it's just one of those things that I stumbled upon in my own methodology to be able to hide the camera, which, which is, I know, like one of the ways to do it. But you know, everybody's finding their own way. So. so that's one of the things I was going to ask you. It's, I mean, you, you hit it. And of course, I'm sitting thinking, oh, okay, so I probably did this, right? You just answered the question, what you did. But is there is there a way? I've got a big white wall over there. Can I put? You know, an eight by soft box on that wall, and that can easily be replaced. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking about green screen. I'm just talking about something yeah, no, it's, like uh, that. So if I'm breaking the planes of this stuff, I get it. Yeah. But I think those are where the microphones from the ceiling, you know, ceiling tiles or ceiling to ceilings, it stays fixed, right? So how easy is it going to be to hide that information in post with a different graphic? Well, and you also have to consider the seams. Like one thing, one trick I found with the seams is if you put a camera kind of like along the edge like this, it, the seam just blends right in with the edge of the table. So it's those kinds of tricks that you can use as far as crowd replacement to, right. to hedge your bets a little bit as far as hiding those other elements. It, it's funny you talk about the seam. I was noticing when you were doing the um, like the uh, the bluegrass or some of those things. It, it, uh, we spent a lot of time. We were doing like club shots where you have a really brightly lit stage and then you have this dark audience. Trying, trying to put the seam somewhere, and not just because like where the seam is, but where the light is. Because say you get the seam on a light, and then you get this really bright spot, and then, it's, then suddenly it's dark, and you're just oh my god! And you can't. A lot of times, like with the cut, you can't preview it beforehand, right. so you're like, please God, let the seam be somewhere nice, you know. So you learn like, but those are things that in the future you're not even going to have to worry about yeah. because you know these. So a lot hey, of slice of film. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys know what he means by the seam? Yeah, so. I'm picturing it vertical, but I guess it's, it would be horizontal. No, well, it depends so like, on the camera. This rig right here, there's a camera in the front and a camera in the back. Each one is shooting uh, slightly over 180, probably like 185, 190, something like that. Uh, and what happens is that there's an overlap on the sides. So when you put it in post, you have to match. 
this camera and this camera and this scene to get it to fit. And there's a cut. Up, there's a cutoff. There's a distance range. There's like a blind how, spot. Yeah, a blind spot based on how this one is rather wide because there's a lot of space between there. So if you were to get right up in between that camera, your face would get cut off. Okay, we all have it here. Yeah. We all have the video where the guy's gone. walking, he disappears, and he comes yeah. back up. Yeah. Well, the thing, thing with like half is two half spheres. Right. right. They're yes. basically two half spheres. You get stitched together into a full sphere. So, so this camera the is worth seeing. Yeah. The lenses are only this far apart. And that camera, the lenses are this far apart. Well, it may not seem like a big deal. That's that blind spot that we're talking about. Just make sure everybody understands that piece of it. How long is your film, Sean? Uh, this first one's about seven and a half minutes. The next one we're doing is roughly around 12 or 15, I think. Yeah. So. Yeah, one thing that I've learned about uh, just the, the nature of the content, one of the other things that's also a little bit different about the story time, is that nobody's doing full feature length films yet. You can't. I mean, physically, you can't. If, you, if you're upset in VR for any, for any length of time, after like an hour, you're tired. Because your brain is working like, you know, way harder than having to process all this information. There's no escape in it. So, like, I found that you know, most of the stuff that's out there is short form. I think the longest thing I've seen is maybe half an hour. So, it's another, it's a physicality watching that you have to watch out for. Too. What's the best way to see your film? Uh, you can see it on YouTube. Uh, it's on YouTube VR. Uh, if you just go to YouTube, uh, you, can, you can just look for A Breath Away. It'll say Special Sneak Preview. <laughs> you can also go to my website, cinema-alliance.com. There's also a link to the front page there. But, so, but in addition to seeing it there, you can put it in Google.